So this is my final video for AP Bio Unit 7. This is topic 713 and it's on the origins of life on Earth. Now I do want to make a disclaimer, this is not my area of expertise. And so I will be hitting just the basics and if you need more in-depth um, discussion, the internet is full of resources, right? Or your textbook or your teacher. But anyway, let's go ahead and start with the history of um, geologic time on Earth. So Earth is about 4.6 billion years old, and we can divide Earth's geologic history into different time periods. So the units, or the scale that we use is um, eons. So there's four eons um, divided down or broken down into eras, and then those eras are broken down into periods. Now the area or the time period that we are gonna be focusing on is the Precambrian time period of Earth. Now, this is when life first evolved, um, and it's in an area or a time period on Earth before oxygen was really in our atmosphere. So we do have some fossil evidence. Um, we have some rocks in Australia and one more place on Earth that scientists um, have used different techniques to identify that these rocks are actually from about 3.5 to 3.9 billion years ago, and we can actually see fossilized protobionts or like early cells. Um, in that, uh, in those fossils. Anyway, so let's go ahead though and talk about the conditions on early Earth. Um, Earth, when it was first formed, was very hostile and um, like volatile. Uh, scientists actually can't find any rocks from the first 500 to 700 million years of Earth's history because Earth was actually so hot at some points that it reached 2000 degrees Celsius literally melting Earth's rocky mantle. Now, during this time period, um, the Earth fluctuated between extreme hot and then also extreme cold. We have some times in early Earth where we actually had a, um, like the entire globe was frozen. I think it's called like a snowball Earth. I think that happened twice in Earth's history. Um, during the early years of Earth, we also, our Earth was also bombarded with meteor, meteorites and asteroids, like literally hundreds of thousands of asteroids and meteors were striking the Earth, some of which could have vaporized entire oceans. So it wasn't until about 4 billion to 4.4 billion years ago that water from this hot Earth eventually like condensed into liquid form. But let's go back and focus on what our big picture is talking about the origins of life on Earth. So early Earth was very extreme, um, and it wasn't until Earth kind of started to settle down a little bit that life began to evolve. Now, there are two hypotheses that we're going to discuss. Now, let's be real. We can't recreate the conditions of early Earth. Um, we're going to use different lines of evidence and scientific research to try and explore um, and hypothesize how life may have started on Earth. And the two that we're going to discuss are the primordial soup model as well as extraterrestrial origin. So, but before we talk about the origin of life on Earth or the hypotheses and the um, ideas that scientists have to ex currently explain how life may have started on Earth, let's start with the basics. Like, what is the most basic unit of life on Earth, right? Well, it's the cell. So as we talk about the origin of life, we want to keep in mind um, properties of cells. So cells, they multiply and divide. They're self-replicating. Um, when we think, well, what are cells made out of? Hopefully you've made it through a couple biology classes or units, and you know that cells are made of organic molecules. Well, these organic molecules include carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, nucleic acids. So all of these macromolecules, if we tie this back into unit one in AP Bio, these macromolecules are made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So did early Earth contain these elements to be chemical precursor, precursors sorry, for these organic molecules? Like, could the elements and molecules on early Earth have combined in a way to create macromolecules that then can join together to form cells? Like, that is really what we're looking at. So there was actually a famous experiment that we're going to talk about in the 1950s that addressed this. So let's take a look, though, at early um, the early atmosphere on Earth. So Earth's, let me move my face, sorry. The early atmosphere on planet Earth did not contain oxygen. 
So it was a reducing atmosphere that had a lot of carbon dioxide, nitrogen gas, methane, ammonia, hydrogen gas, hydrogen sulfide, and a lot of water vapor. Now this atmosphere, um, because it was a reducing atmosphere, it actually required less energy for chemical reactions to occur. So scientists Stanley Miller and Harold Urey in 1953 tried to recreate this early um, Earth's atmosphere and oceans to see if they could do an experiment that would actually create organic molecules. Organic molecules means that they're carbon based. So what they did is they built this apparatus that you can see here on the left where they built this apparatus with a glass chamber and the gas they put inside um, contained, we have the water, the methane, the ammonia, the hydrogen gas. Um, and what they did was they tried to recreate early earth um, by first creating a reducing atmosphere with the gases that they thought were present. Notice there is no oxygen. The early earth's atmosphere did not have oxygen present. Then they placed it over liquid water to represent the early ocean. And then they maintained a temperature of around 100 degrees, or right below 100 degrees Celsius and tried to keep that pretty stable. Then instead of lightning, lightning, they hypothesized, was like the energy input to form chemical reactions on early Earth. So they used sparks of electricity uh, to mimic that lightning. And what they found, hold on, where's the results? What they actually saw was that within a week, 15% of the carbon found in the methane had actually converted into other simple organic compounds. So some simple organic compounds that first formed was formaldehyde and hydrogen cyanide. Now the hydrogen cyanide is an important molecule that actually contributes to the ring structure in adenine, which is the nitrogen base that we find in RNA, it's the A, um, the A that pairs with U, and then the A that pairs with T. Um, adenine is also the nitrogen base found in ATP. Anyway, so we have formaldehyde and hydrogen cyanide that actually can, they can recombine or form together and form other simple molecules like formic acid, urea, glycine, alanine. So they actually had amino acids and simple organic molecules forming within a week. Now, since Miller and Urey, other scientists have carried out similar experiments and they have produced over 30 different carbon compounds, including the amino acids, glycine, alanine, glutamic acid, valine, proline, and aspartic acid. So this was the first experiment to show that, yeah, we can have organic molecules form on early earth. Now, however, there was a second hypothesis that I mentioned, and that was the hypothesis that maybe organic molecules arrived from um, like outer space. And it seems kind of far-fetched, but if we remember, I mentioned earlier that hundreds of thousands of meteorites and asteroids were actually striking Earth. Now, scientists hypothesized that organic molecules could have been transported to Earth by a meteorite or other celestial event. But what evidence exists for that, right? So uh, one example that scientists have is that, one out of many, is that in Tagish Lake in the year 2000 in British Columbia, a meteor meteorite struck earth and scientists analyzed it and they found that three percent of its weight was actually organic matter and had trace elements of acids like simple acids as well as um, some trace levels of amino acids so right now within my lifetime i was in high school in the year 2000 uh, we actually had a meteorite carrying amino acids from outer space onto planet earth so again these are hypotheses that um I don't want to say, I hate the word proven. We're not going to prove a hypothesis because they can always change. Um, but right now, that's our current proposals of, of the origins of life. But life is more than just organic molecules. Um, when we talk about like metabolic pathways, for example, um, scientists hypothesize the first cells on Earth were actually autotrophic or autotrophic, sorry, meaning that they can build all their complex organic molecules from simpler ones. For example, glucose can actually be made from formaldehyde. So these cells could have taken the formaldehyde in the environment um, and then converted it into glucose and then saved it. Now scientists also suspect or hypothesize that the first cell membranes of the simplest cells weren't necessarily phospholipids but most likely fatty acids. 
And so these um, early cells were called protobionts and or protocells, and they were basically um, like bubbles surrounded in uh, fatty acids. But um, let's think a little bit more about metabolic pathways. Oh, sorry for my face. Um, so metabolic pathways today rely on enzymes and chemical reactions happening. So let's talk a little bit about catalyzing reactions in early Earth. Now, enzymes today are what we have, or that have evolved. Enzymes today are what have evolved to catalyze lots of our cellular reactions. However, there's one more organic molecule that can catalyze reactions, and it's RNA. Oh wait, where's my, there it is, it's RNA. Now RNA can catalyze some types of RNA can catalyze chemical reactions, and it also stores genetic information. So this leads us to a hypothesis uh, called the RNA world hypothesis. There are some scientists who, um, I don't like to use the word believe, but there's some scientists who have enough as evidence to support the RNA world hypothesis that the first um, nucleic acid that was self-replicating was actually RNA and not DNA. So in the RNA world hypothesis, there's actually um, like RNA sequences that act as catalysts and they're called ribozymes and they can carry out enzymatic functions. Now in an RNA world, a catalytic RNA could actually catalyze a reaction to make a copy of itself and therefore pass on genetic information. So when we think about this, when cells are dividing, here we have a possible method for genetic information to pass from one generation to the next. If RNA, oh, sorry, RNA is catalytic and it can like self-replicate, that makes sense that it would then be the genetic material, then pass on um, DNA, or oh, sorry, uh, RNA sequences through generations of cells. Now, another piece of, and I have a picture on my next slide to help explain this a little bit for you, um, but then I also wanna point out that Another piece of evidence for an RNA world is that ribosomes carry out translation of mRNA into proteins, but it's our RNA sequences within the ribosome that is the main mechanism for translation. So when we think about life on Earth and how we use these proteins, it's actually our RNA and mRNA and tRNA that are responsible for producing these proteins, which is another source of evidence for an RNA world hypothesis. So if we look at this picture here, here, first step, RNA forms from inorganic sources. RNA self-replicates versus, uh, versus via uh, ribozymes. Now in step three, RNA catalyzes protein synthesis. We have rRNA, mRNA, tRNA. Now in step four, uh, as this like RNA world hypothesis went on and life evolved, membrane formation, so those like fatty acid layers, um, changes the internal chemistry, allowing new functionality. So in step five, RNA can code for actually both DNA and protein. Now we've seen this in retroviruses where the like RNA can actually be used to produce DNA. And then if we have the RNA, the RNA is also the code for proteins. So that this kind of simple graphic kind of lays the foundation for the RNA world hypothesis that RNA was actually the first um, genetic material compared to DNA. Now, while DNA today, it is more stable than RNA. So that's one reason why they hypothesized DNA, I don't want to say like took over as a genetic material. Now, I also want to just round out my discussion on early earth with um, the uh, discussion on cyanobacteria and when photosynthesis first evolved. So I mentioned in the beginning how early atmosphere um, didn't have oxygen. So it wasn't until cyanobacteria and the ability for photosynthesis to occur um, that oxygen actually like was created. And so scientists also kind of um, predict that, or hypothesize predict, that it was about 200 million years of photosynthesis before oxygen actually made its way into the atmosphere. If photosynthesis evolved in the oceans, um, there's evidence that the cyanobacteria or um, other like algae and photosynthetic organisms, as they produce oxygen, it actually reacted with um, elemental iron and then precipitated out uh, and of the water. And so eventually, though, oxygen levels um, increased 
And now our atmosphere today 